Welcome to the Arrive Podcast, the U.S. Immigration Law Podcast for Canadians. I'm your host, Jeremy Richards, along with fellow U.S. immigration lawyer, Christine Jerusik. Welcome. Today, we will be discussing the impacts that the COVID-19 virus has had on U.S. immigration. And recently, there have been two developments with U.S. immigration and COVID-19 and the vaccine requirements um, that the U.S. is now implementing and some confusion around who is required to get that COVID-19 vaccination and who is not. We've received a lot of phone calls on this Mm -hmm. and a lot of current clients are concerned and have questions about how this is going to impact them in their case. So the first big announcement was goes into effect on October 1st, which is actually tomorrow. And that announcement is that those that are immigrating to the United States, in other words, people that are coming to live here permanently, these aren't people that are coming as visitors or on work visas. These are people that are coming with the intent to obtain a green card and to reside permanently in the United States. In other words, one people at the consulate, they're getting an immigrant visa to enter or those that are already in the United States and are filing to adjust their status from a temporary non-immigrant visa to a permanent resident in the United States. All of those individuals starting October 1st will have to have proof that they have been vaccinated for COVID-19. Now, there are very limited exceptions for this, and we're not even going to get into that because they're so limited and they're hard hard to prove uh, the exemptions to, to the COVID-19 vaccination. So for all intents and purposes, if you are immigrating to the United States, you will be required to have the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, the other announcement was that beginning in November, and they didn't give a date on this, which is you know, it gives them room to make more announcements and I guess to modify it as, as they move forward. But beginning in November, if you're traveling to the United States, international travel by air, then you will also be required to have a COVID-19 vaccination. And that applies to anybody that's traveling to the United States. You, as a visitor, as an immigrant, uh, as a worker, it doesn't matter. International travelers will be re- required to have that COVID-19 vaccine. So that has a huge impact on individuals coming to the United States. The majority of the world gets to the United States by air. So by default, most people coming to the United States are going to have to have the COVID-19 vaccine. If you're immigrating, you're going to have to have the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, this is where Canadians actually have a benefit under the USMCA and also by being our neighbor just across the border and also Mexicans to the south. If you're traveling by land, however, there is still no requirement for a COVID-19 vaccination. So if you are coming into the United States as a visitor by land, which you can't do right now from Canada um, Or or, or Mexico, or if you're coming on a TN visa, or an L-1 visa, or an E-visa, or any other work visa, and you're traveling by land, there is no COVID-19 vaccination requirement Right, they haven't come out and said that they're going to require it at the land borders. So we just don't have any direction on that right now, and it may come into play, but right now we, you know, it doesn't look like that's the requirement going forward. Yeah, currently it's not, but the border is not open yet for, uh, for leisure, for pleasure. It's only open for legitimate business purposes or if you have a valid work visa to come to the United States. So we'll see Mm -hmm. Uh, more announcements to come on that. Uh, But that's the current situation. So if you're a Canadian and and you have a TN and L and E visa, you can still come to the United States on that visa. If you're traveling by land without the need of getting the COVID-19 vaccination, the safest thing, however, you have the COVID-19 vaccination, then you can travel Whatever way you want to the United States, your your travel won't be impeded as long as you have the right authorization to enter the United States. But this has also impacted processing and other issues related to U.S. immigration. So, I'm. Was that your lead in? Yes. (laughs) All right. So, I I recently gave a talk on. um, Reset, like do a pause and then go in. 
All right. I, so I recently gave a talk um, to the New York relocation experts group um, on the effects of COVID-19 on business immigration. Um, and, you know, I kind of broke it down for those business owners so that they could understand why they are having such serious repercussions trying to bring their employees in from other countries to the United States. Um, you know, and the delays that we're experiencing, I mean, that's the number one result of COVID-19, everything across the board with the United States Immigration Services and uh, Department of State has just uh, really experienced delays throughout well, and the process. Life is delayed, right? <laughs> yeah. We order furniture, it takes months. Yep. You order anything now, there's, there's supply chain delays. So it's rolled over into everything. And yeah. I think anybody listening would know that life has changed because of COVID supply chains, everything have been impacted, but right. especially so immigration. Yeah. It's requiring a lot of patience on, on the part of our clients right now. But if we look at the effects, we could actually break it down into three groups of non U S employees based on the type of immigration processing they need and how it is going to affect the process. So the first group is people that can process inside the United States. So if you're looking for employees um, possibly non-U.S. ones, um, the first place to look would be right here within our borders. There are many people eligible to work in the United States. They may be in a different status right now. They may be students. They may be you know, completing their practical training, um, but they could file a change of status and remain in the U.S. and avoid these delays that we're seeing with the Department of State and, uh, you know, just then they would just file with USCIS here in the U.S. Yeah, and so, I think I think from an HR perspective or even from a business perspective, that is one of the best ways to get a foreign worker or to fill a need if, if it has to be done through a foreign employment. Um, and you do a change of employer. You know, you don't have to do the lottery if it's an H-1B, which is, which is ridiculous already, or mess with the border, right? You're just doing a change of status here in the United States and you just transfer that employee right over to to your company and they can start and working right frankly, away. Frankly, I mean that employee could be here even in a visitor status and yep. change their status over if they if they find a job with you. So that's a great place to to seek a, a workforce if maybe they're the US labor market's a little Yeah, and the only delays there are processing with USCIS and mm-hmm. and and all these cases we're talking about you can pay for premium processing if you want to and you'll get a decision in 15 days and some of them if it's an h1b transfer for example you don't have to wait for approval so as soon as it's filed they can start working for you immediately other ones such as a tn and we're changing from one status to another status however they can't start until they're approved, but premium processing can eliminate those delays and make right. it only a couple of weeks instead of months. Yeah. And and we saw a huge increase in clients utilizing this within the U S or USCIS processing during COVID where formerly they would maybe send their client outside to process at the border or in their home country. People are trying to avoid that now at all costs. So it's, it's a great, still a great way to process for employees. And USCIS took huge advantage of this. By yeah. increasing their premium processing <laughs> fee during COVID, which is <laughs> yeah. smart for them, but costly for those that are trying to do this. Absolutely. But in some cases, it's definitely worth it. So, um, you know, the second group of those of people that we're looking at are those that can process at a land border or possibly at airport preclearance with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. This is a completely different agency than USCIS, but um, CBP does have the power to make some and adjudicate some types of petitions for certain individuals, including Canadians and Mexicans. So, you know, it's, it, you know, some Mexicans. So it's possible that you could look at that, you know, as a source of your workforce as well. So if you can find somebody in Canada or Mexico that is able to process at the border, that can work very well too for certain types of visas yeah the the canadian advantage i i all of the business clients that i speak with when they're having trouble hiring people i always point them to canada say go to canada hire canadians if they're in a a tn profession and then they can get that visa same Mm -hmm. day or that status same day at a port of entry it's canadians throughout covid i think are one of the least impacted uh, groups of people coming to the United States because they've been able to, as, as far as work visas go, 
been able to still obtain L visas, TN visas seamlessly at a port of entry right. plus and change that, of status in the U.S. And, and that border closure does not apply to them. So you've all heard, you know, March 20th, 2020, the U.S. closed the border to Canada and Mexico for land travel for visitors. But that did not impact people making applications with CBP or people that hold current status in the United States. They have been able to freely travel back and forth. Uh, we did get a lot of calls at the beginning of COVID from permanent residents of the United States that said they were stuck in Canada and they couldn't get back to the U.S., which just isn't true. You could you could have been traveling throughout COVID with with a green card to the United States. It's, yeah, it's actually the opposite. Immigration status. I have a client go yesterday or the day before to extend his L1 visa, mm-hmm. and the border officer asked him why he hadn't been to the U.S. recently. Because it, it had been several months because it, he thought because of COVID, he couldn't come here. Not true. They, and if you're on an L or one of these types of visas, they actually expect you to be here. Because that's why you need the visa is to work in the United States. So if you're on a TN visa and you haven't been to the United States in two years, well, you don't need a TN visa. That says you can right. work remotely. Mm-hmm. So why should they even give you the visa? They become harder to renew. Maybe yes. These questions of so that you have nature. to be careful. You need to maintain your status. And just like you said. In your presence. Yeah. yeah. Your presence in the U.S. They don't want everyday travel. That's what they're trying to avoid. Even if you have a work visa, unless you can show you're essential. But if you're coming periodically, that's okay. As long as you have that valid visa, it's that every day people do. I have lots of clients that have TNs that travel daily for work and they haven't had an issue. Yeah. So you make sure you maintain your visa. COVID's not an excuse because the border is only closed for certain people. Yeah, It's really only closed for visitors. So if you yeah. have a status in the United States, you have employment authorization or you're seeking employment I always throw Disney under the bus, but if you're going to Disney, no, you can't <laughs> come in. Poor Disney. <laughs> well, Um, You know, so the effects we have seen on this processing at the land ports is that now certain ports of entry require appointments. Pre-COVID, there was no appointment required. You could just show up and process. But, you know, check with your attorney and make sure that you have the correct time and that you have the contact information to reach out to CBP. Because a lot of times you'll show up and they may say, oh, do you have an appointment? And they'll turn you away, uh, which could be a few hours drive depending on where you're coming from. Yeah. And there are fewer appointments because of that. Where before, you know, 20 people could show up at one time and they're just going to wait and mm. you just sit there until you're adjudicated. Now, they they only offer appointments between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. Monday to Friday at these land ports. Right. So if you don't have an appointment, and we've seen some, depending on what port you're going to, some of them are more popular than others. It could be a week or two before you can get an appointment at that port if that's the port you want to go to. So you definitely need a plan in advance. Mm-hmm. And the other thing we've seen is a little bit of increased scrutiny um, with TN applications at the border. So, you know, previous in L1 applications at the border as well. Previously, you know, certain types of uh, occupation would receive a certain level of scrutiny. And we're seeing across the board an increase in questioning Uh, I think these border officers have some extra time on their hands and they're spending it to be a little bit more thorough with their adjudication, which is, uh, you know, maybe a good thing from some perspectives, but from others, it could, uh, you know, complicate your situation. So if you've been approved in the past and maybe they glossed over certain uh, concerns with your application this time around, make sure that you've addressed them all and you know what to say, because uh, it's unlikely they're going to gloss over anything at this point of the game. Yeah. And if, In the end, if you're properly prepared and qualified, you have that right documentation, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, the scrutiny has gone up significantly. It seems though recently it's kind of tapered off and they may be getting into more of a routine. I think with all the changes with COVID and and that, um, (laughs) I I don't think a lot of the officers wanted anyone coming at all. Right. So if you showed up, they just didn't want to see you. Um, well, nobody but now wanted to see become, anybody during COVID and yeah. they were required to work with the public. So, yep. you know, they were a little apprehensive, understandably. But now we have to live with it, so to speak, right? Yeah. We have to move forward and they are in a routine now of how they handle these cases. And, um, we just need to be aware of when you're, when you're applying of all of the new requirements. Mm-hmm. And one of the other impacts we've seen is that airports have turned into very good places to make applications. Airport preclearance used to be a very hectic, uh, you know, place to make a TN or L1 application. 
but with less people traveling, um, we've seen very good, consistent decision making out of the pre-clearance airports in Canada. Yeah, throughout COVID, yeah, and part of that might be also an impact of less tr- flights, right? Mm-hmm. So they have the the flip side where um, when you're flying in the airports, just congested, they have, they're just trying to make a decision real quick, and they don't have time for something, yeah. so they might just turn you away because they don't have time to deal with you. Mm-hmm. Whereas now they do have the time to deal with you. Uh, so they are providing a more thorough review of the application rather than just turning people away. Yep, and and very consistent decision making where you know you can you can understand their reasoning and and if you do get a denial, it's typically justified. Yeah, the de- and that's one thing I will say is the deni- the majority of the denials that we've seen recently or throughout COVID have been justified. Because they're doing a very thorough review. Mm -hmm. They're looking at everything before they make that decision. Uh, So if you're denied, depending on the situation, that officer, I've been finding myself tell people that call in, you should have been denied. They were right. Yeah. They did a correct interpretation of your documents. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there's nothing we can do to help you. You're not qualified. Correct. So, I mean, the third group of people, so, you know, that need to possibly make an application with the U.S. immigration system are those that are outside the United States and need to process at the embassy or consulate in their home country. So this would include anybody that's outside of Canada or Mexico and outside of a visa waiver country. Um, You know, March 20th, 2020, again, the Department of State suspended routine visa services at all embassies and consulates worldwide. Um, we had to turn people away from their interviews. I had people traveling to the consulate for their interview and said, I said, you know, turn your car around. <laughs> your interview has been canceled. And we had hoped at the time that it would be rescheduled within a few weeks. Unfortunately, some of those people uh, waited up to a year to get their interview rescheduled. And some of them are still waiting. So, um, yeah, and the, and the Department of State recently issued a tiered approach to alleviating the backlogs at the consulates and embassies and they gave a four-tiered approach and employment-based cases are tier four yeah so some of those embassies and consulates still remain closed actually and most of them have reopened but they've reopened on a very limited schedule and like jeremy said with the tiered approach to how they're offering their interviews um and business or uh, you know, employees, they're just, they're not on the priority right now. So um, that means people who have approved petitions with USCIS can't even get the visa they need to travel to the U.S. to start their employment. So there's people that, you know, were successful in the H-1B lottery, were approved for an H-1B and are still sitting in their home country waiting for the ability to travel to the United States. So there's even, you know, in addition to that Department of State slowdown across the board, we've seen country-specific restrictions as well. Um, Certain presidential proclamations were put into place back in 2020. First, that affected China. Then it moved on to Iran. And then um, in Proclamation 10143, President Biden, you know, banned people from South Africa, the Schengen area of Europe, which includes 26 countries, the UK, Ireland, Brazil. These were all affected. And there's people still waiting in those countries for an interview. Um, You know, there's certain ways you can get around this. One of them is a national interest exception. If you can show that the person has, you know, a certain uh, level of work that needs to come in to, you know, maybe work in an essential field or um, they are one of these people that, you know, is, you know, directing the company. A lot of times you can make a national interest exception argument and get get an interview for those individuals. But it does prolong the processing because you need to now ask for a discretionary decision to allow them to come in and get an interview. Yeah, and you also, yeah, and you also need to be aware. And we, I've had this happen three times in the past two mm-hmm. weeks, where an individual already has a visa in the United States, and then they travel to one of these countries. And there's certain some of these countries, if you've been in a designated country for at all, you cannot come to the United States within. 14 days of visiting that country Mm -hmm. so just because you have a valid visa doesn't just give you the blanket approval to go anywhere you want in the world 
if you're trying to come back to the U.S. and you visited certain countries, you, they may not let you back in for 14 days. Right. So I had a client to try to apply for an L visa. Country. Yeah. You, I had a Canadian client who I forget what country she went to, but she had gone over somewhere and I think it was somewhere in Europe and visited and then came back to the, to Canada to then go apply for her L visa. Well, it was within 14 days of her oh, visit her to that, of yeah. her return. So they turned her away, told her she had to wait 14 days. Then she applied for her L. Canada's not on the list, so she's lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, but And I've had two, two other clients do the same thing. They went on vacation, and they went on to a country that was designated, and they wanted to come back to the U.S., but they couldn't. So I think in all these cases, they ended up going to Canada, having to wait out 14 days, and then come back to the U.S. So right. you got to be careful of that, too. Yeah, and we've had clients wait out that two-week you know, limit to in in a third country. But so and just I, so well, you know, the exception is I actually have it right here. Is you need to show you're traveling to provide vital support or executive direction to critical infrastructure, significant economic activity. It also includes journalists, extraordinary humanitarian circumstances, or in support of national security or public health. So um, that's the argument you need to make. They have expanded these exceptions to certain other people. Um, but if you are in one of those countries and you're looking to travel to the United States on a visa, this is some, this is an argument you still need to make up until November when they change it over to the vaccination requirement. So these should all go away in November, hopefully. Um, these presidential proclamations will be withdrawn and they will rely solely on proof of vaccination. vaccination yeah. 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 And I had another client who was Chinese or is Chinese, mm-hmm. valid H1 visa. But the visa stamp in in their passport is had it expired, um, but the status had been extended here in the U.S. Went to China, which is on the list. Mm-hmm. And based on our conversation, right, you can't get an appointment at the consulate to get restamped for a visa. Well, couldn't get restamped for the H one B visa in China He's because they're there. not processing the non immigrant work visas in China, right? Luckily, this individual also had a pending adjustment application and and another travel authorization that they relied on to enter the U.S. Otherwise, this individual would still be in China. So, lucked out. So, you need to be very careful before you travel outside the United States right now due to COVID and make sure uh, your your ability to reenter the country is not going to be impacted. Thank you for joining us today. If you haven't already... Please subscribe where you listen to your favorite podcasts. Give us a thumbs up and a five-star rating. And most importantly, tune in next time to the Arrive podcast, the U.S. Immigration Law Podcast for Canadians.